Good afternoon. A warm welcome to our Conversations program. My name is Emily Butler. I'm the Conversations Curator here at Art Basel. Welcome to our audiences who are watching online. We're absolutely thrilled to be hosting uh, a discussion with four speakers who bring different perspectives on collecting, but most importantly, investing and supporting NFT initiatives this afternoon. They will also uh, consider the important question of identity and gender in the field. We are thrilled to welcome B, aka Beauty and Punk, uh, and Fanny Lacoube, who is joining us remotely. Fanny, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you fine. Excellent. Um, uh, and also Sarah Meyerhaus, who's an artist investor, and Kate Vass, the founder of and curator of Kate Vass Gallery. The talk will be moderated by Annie Shaw from the art newspaper. And the conversation will last approximately 50 minutes. We'll have 10 minutes for questions at the end. We'll be passing a mic around, so feel free to wait to the mic to ask your, ask your question. Um, for audiences watching online, do feel free to pop your questions in the chat, and I'll um, hope to convey some of those questions to the panelists. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the conversation. I'll hand over to Annie. But please do give our speakers a very warm round of applause and enjoy the conversation. So as Emily uh, mentioned, this is a panel about collecting NFTs and all of our panelists, speakers here um, do collect NFTs, but I also wanted to briefly highlight the hybrid roles that they all occupy. So Fanny, we have um, joining us by Zoom, has been collecting and advising on collecting digital art for 14 years, and she is also a curator. Kate here in the middle opened a physical gallery in Zurich in 2017, uh, specializing in art and technology. But she's also been collecting a mixture of physical and digital art since 2005, so a very early, early adopter here. Uh, B here to my right, you, you collect art from the 1500s onward, I believe, yes. including NFTs. Um, and you also launched Rise Dow in 2021, which helps women artists by providing grants that cover gas and minting fees so they can sell art on uh, NFT marketplaces. And last but not least, Sarah, over there, you're an artist who uses technology to address um, questions about the nature of value. You're also an investor in tech-related businesses, is that correct? And last, last but not least, a, co a collector of NFTs and crypto art. So, uh, very accomplished women next to me here. But um, first of all, I just wanted to define for the, the purpose of this conversation what it means to collect NFTs, because the term NFT is, is, a, is a wide catch-all term for a variety of digital assets. Um, Fanny, if I could ask you online, as a seasoned collector, if I could ask you, what, what does it mean to collect NFTs in the context of this discussion? Um, yeah, um, well, first, thanks for having me. I'm calling from New York, sadly missing all the fun. Um, and to go back to your question, like what does it mean to collect NFTs? Well, I would argue that it doesn't really mean much uh, or actually better, it, it, it can mean anything. Um, NFTs are really the transactional vehicle or the envelope uh, through which you can authenticate, timestamp, buy, sell like a, a digital asset, but that asset itself can literally be anything from gaming asset to virtual fashion, real estate, collectible, and finally art. Uh, so, but if you look at the um, data published on all use cases for NFTs, art is only around 16% of all applications uh, for NFTs, one sixth. And it does vary uh, depending on the blockchain that you are considering. Uh, but art is a small use case uh, of NFTs. And for us, it's actually more accurate, I believe, for um, that conversation to really talk about crypto art, NFT art, or even blockchain art, which was more used uh, back in the days. Um, and then within crypto art, you have many categories. You have photography, conceptual art, software art, generative art. So. Um, you know, most people I advise, like they start saying like, I want to collect NFTs, but when they discover the depths of the field, um, they, um, all tend to refine their taste and, and really it's, it's not unlike any other collectors, uh, really. Thank you, Fanny. So I think we can all agree on that sort of smaller definition for the purpose of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'd like to jump in uh, straight in with a question about collecting um, for investment versus artistic merit. And I think it would be fair to say that the NFT market has been fueled by speculation, um, certainly in the very early days, and indeed still. Yeah. We've seen reports of a 92% crash in value um, for NFTs, though those figures have been questioned. I want to put it to each of our panelists. Do you collect for investment or, or aesthetic value, aesthetic or conceptual value, and, or both, indeed. And if you collect for artistic merit, what exactly um, is it about the NFTs you collect that moves you, that you're passionate about? Could I ask you B first? Thank you. Well, I have to say, I, I collect because I love art. I used to love art before, and I continue to love it. And I, I'm a big, firm believer on the blockchain, and all the users as Fanny was saying, like all the things that we can do uh, with NFTs. So just putting art into that it, using that technology to, to, you know, move art and buy art and find collectors and find artists, I find it fascinating. I buy art because I love it. If, if one day it will be valued more, I think that would not be a bad thing. I am a terrible seller. So all the art that I have, I really hold, I really like to keep because it has spoken to me. And I have found myself gravitating more and more to women uh, produced art. Just because I look at it and something really clicks with me. And then I look, oh yeah, and it's by a female artist. I, I don't really look for it. It kind of just finds me serendipitously. So do you turn the same eye to a work from 1500 to that of NFT? Actually, my oldest piece of art is by a woman. So yes, uh, somehow I, I, it connects in a deeper level. And it's just very easy for me to, to want to have it. So luckily, I have the means to, to uh, you know, acquire most things that I'm passionate about. And uh, if you will increase in value, great. But uh, that's with any investment, any piece of art that we buy here at Art Basel, right? If you buy because you love it, uh, if it goes down in price, it's OK, because your, the value that you give is more than monetary. You know, there's emotional value, there's intellectual value, there's, you know, there's deeper levels to it. So you right? keep hold of your NFTs, you don't sell them? No, I've either. sold very few in my life. Yeah, I think half a dozen maybe? Like, yeah. Now maybe you can mention that your punk was sold by accident because you placed the prize. It's a 34 ETH, I think. You yeah. Know? And then, you know, over the years, it just got sold accidentally and you yeah. were like, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm fine with that as well. I think, you know, yeah. it happened. Actually, it happened to many uh, in the space because when you were so early and you collected digital punks when they were like, I don't know, two, three dollars maximum for, for, trans for, for transaction. And I think you got yours for free, like you claim Yeah, we just them. had to pay gas fees, exactly, so we just yeah. did transaction so like, like you fee claim them for the block, yeah. And then you, okay. for fun, you just kind of price them, and that was the common case um, <laughs> also for generative artworks uh, back in 2018, 2019, when you kind of, ah, oh, nobody's going to buy it. You just push like, you know, 100 ETH, 200 ETH, 300 ETH. Um, just to state, it was actually kind of a signature for many to state that it's not for sale. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, 2020, 2021, and all of a sudden you receive an email that your work has been sold for 150 ETH and you're like, what the hell? I didn't want to sell. <laughs> but nah, at least it sold very well and Ethereum was yeah. uh, at a good price. So, you know, you, you, you smile, but at the same time you kind of lost the asset, which you didn't really plan to sell, right? So in, in this case, I think we have a similar experiences when uh, um, accidents like that happened. Mm -hmm. And since then, I think also majority of co earlier collectors, they stopped pricing the works. They just kind of delisted everything and, and <laughs> because you don't know how the market will turn out and there are crazy people who can just, you know, buy for yeah. for crazy amount of money. But for instance, with the early crypto punk apes, how did you know that they were significant? Did you look at them and think, Goodness, this is a, an amazing work of art. This well, has a value. It had value. to be value to it because I believe in the blockchain and I love art. And then I suddenly see something that connects the two of them. So it's, it's new. It's fun. There has to be something more to it. So they were all, as, as Kay said, it was, they were all for free. You just had to pay the transaction, you know, to, to change hands, basically, change wallets. And so we paid the, yeah, I paid, we all did pay the gas fees, but that was it. And two days after claim, I actually put it up for 37 ether. And they, they, were had, they had been for free. So it took two years and it sold for 37. But now they are selling for $10 million. 
you know, recently yeah. that, that's what it, they have been selling for, 2,500 Ether. I don't regret that sale, but luckily I have three more to, that I can still bank on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I still have my collection because I didn't end up selling, you know, too, too early. But it ha there had to be something to it. Like, it's this, it was innovative and it's fun and it's something that created a community around. And I think this is something that a lot of projects have and the successful projects have a great one, a community. And, and yeah. And community is a, a very good point. Sarah, you're an artist, yeah. you, you collect too. Um, you mentioned earlier that you often trade, which is not uncommon with artists in, in, in every sphere. Can you just tell me a bit about your reasons for collecting and what you collect and why? Yeah, that's, that's mostly how I've collected is, is traded. Uh, because it's quite easy to trade, you know, you don't need to send a physical piece to someone and have them store it and they send you something. It's, it's quite easy um, and it's just a pleasure to do it. And oftentimes I've traded things that have very different, you know, values, so to speak, with artists and there's the implicit assumption that you're just going to keep it and that you're not doing this to, to speculate. I have also speculated. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're a tech investor, aren't you? I mean, you, you, you... Yeah, but I have speculated a little bit with NFTs, and, you know, it's just silly. It's truly silly. And, and the pricing, the, the accidental sales come from the fact that the platforms don't have sophisticated pricing mechanisms. You don't accidentally sell the stock in your stock portfolio. It's only because these platforms are still figuring out where they lie, uh, you know, in this continuum of trading software and, you know, art NFT fun thing that you get essentially access, you know, that you, you can price things in this way. Yeah. Fanny, if I could ask you the same question, do you collect for uh, investment or aesthetic merit or both? And, and indeed, what do you collect for passion? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I've actually mostly collected um, art by artists I've met or I've researched uh, along the way. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, when you ask about the value of the NFTs, like, and, and for the more into the traditional art market, there's uh, a lot of the um, reception of the object. You know, you hear like, oh, I fell in love with this painting. And, and when you don't have the physical object, uh, I think this is really where the story of the artist, uh, the concept of the work, uh, and how you relate to them uh, become, become even more uh, important uh, in your uh, decision uh, to collect. So as me, I'm a terrible seller as well. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I claim that my collection is permanent and my husband disagrees on that, but um, <laughs> my collection, my choice. And um, yeah, so, but I think it's also, um, uh, we often forget that like, you know, traditional co collectors like, or, you know, if you collect painting, like you also think about it, um, like think about where you put your money and you invest it wisely, right? So, um, so there's always uh, this consideration, I think, what happened with crypto art is that it started with crypto. So the money started first uh, and then um, the aesthetics and the like, you know, artistic value uh, is being reintroduced. And, and I think this is what we're seeing uh, right now. It's a good point. Um, Kate, you mentioned briefly, I mean, you've, you, were an, you were an early adopter in the, in the space. I wondered if you could just give us a brief history of collecting over the past few years. There's been sort of some milestones around 2017, 18. I think the art world cottoned on to uh, uh, the blockchain and there was a bit of movement then. But of course, things exploded in 2020. Could you give us a brief history of sort of that period and, and how your collecting might have changed or how the landscapes changed in that time? Um, yeah, I think, you know, like to be quite short on that, um, everything starts from our social economical environment, right? So we had some shift already in the financial sector uh, towards decentralized finance. And that's where we had Bitcoin and then Ethereum. And therefore, you know, the blockchain and innovation was kind of um, evolving over some time and in in early pioneers like artists like Rea Myers, for example, or Kevin Abosh, or 
um, Kevin McCoy, you know, like they adopted this kind of technology as an artistic tool and they expressed their visions or their conceptual cre creativity uh, with this new tools, which is natural for any artist with the development of a technology uh, to use new kind of ways to express themselves. The same happened with the photography, for example. When uh, photography was found, you know, it was used for to document things, right? But it was also a new technology. Art market also was kind of reluctant to accept photography as a fine art. But over the years, it also naturally happened and people started to collect and museums started to collect. So I think, you know, in this case, it's just, you know, natural kind of merger between the first the economics, right? And then the social factor and, and the um, the, the idea of to, to decentralize things, right, to avoid middle men, middle women <laughs> like ourselves, um, uh, to, to transact and to kind of um, introduce the artist and the collector and uh, the connection between the two to enable the economics of royalties so the artist can also benefit from that. And I think this is the, the, the key here, you know, the key factor that enabled the, the, te the technology enabled the artist to be um, at the center and also to, be, to become financially a little bit more free. I mean, not for everybody, of course, but you can also probably confirm that also this kind of um, benefits, you know, from uh, benefiting from the secondary market sales also allows you to um, create with more create freedom. Because, and also support yeah. other artists, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and, and now we also see an interesting evolution where artists also collect other artists. So it's like supporting each other, which is also beautiful. Um, yeah. Did I answer? They don't you want did, to, you yeah. did. And we will come back to this idea yeah. of the middleman or middlewoman, but um, if we could put our artist front and centre, if we may, Sarah, I'd like to ask you about a few of your artistic projects. Um, and as we mentioned at the top, you make art which has a relationship to currency or which examines the creation of value. And I know you've talked about the creation of Bitcoin as a creative moment, which I think is a lovely idea. Can you just tell us a bit about how your Bitcoin project, which you began, I think, about a year after Bitcoin, began. Can you tell us a bit about that evolution and that project, please? Yeah, so I was in grad graduate school studying art, and I was thinking a lot about the nature of value, how it's constructed, the nature of currency, right, which you kind of mostly just equate to legal tender, but that's not true, right? Currency is more an adjective. Things have currency, even airline miles have currency. and. Currency is also, you know, there are representations that circulate. So this is, currency is a representation. And I heard about Bitcoin, thought it was amazing how it was this creative act, this anonymous individual, not a corporation, suddenly creating so much value, creating a system of value. And then other people started forking Bitcoin. So there was Litecoin, Dogecoin came out around that time. And I thought it would be great to make an art project called Bitchcoin. Uh, and, and then I quickly realized no one would want to buy my Bitchcoins unless I could link it to something of value. And so I chose to back Bitchcoins by my artwork, which I aptly called Speculations, which is also you know, a big use case of crypto. And the photographs are visual metaphors of a blockchain. They're made with specular like mirrors that extend infinitely. And the, the key to all this is really that it was done before Ethereum was launched. So smart contracts didn't exist, and I literally had to create physical certificates with a public key written on the front and a private key on the back that held the token that people could buy and hold physically that would represent you know, the token and the backing. And then um, you know, Bitcoin has since evolved and transitioned, and Ethereum fulfills the promise of it. And so now there are NFTs on Ethereum, um, backed by these physical rose petals from another, from another project. Uh, but that's how, I, that's how I got into it, um, you know, the, the promise of blockchain. And he really it kind of preceded it. It, it. it was a precursor to NFTs, as you say. It was before Ethereum existed. You kind of invented <laughs> NFTs 
I mean, that might be a bit yeah. of a stretch, but it was indeed a model which... There were a, there were a few different projects all around the same time that were interested in blockchain, uh, but the premise of, of really turning yourself as an artist into a currency, into a bit of a social token, um, and also the proposal of like taking physical art and fractionalizing it and putting it on a blockchain. Yeah, Bitcoin, yeah, the first one, but like. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned, how does that project relate to your Cloud of Petals project? Yeah. That's... So Bitcoin was its own chain, which is kind of like defunct. It was never meant to be like a major blockchain. It was two nodes, right? Mining in a shipping container unit in Brooklyn. And so to bring it onto Ethereum, I did this giant proof of work, right? So proof of work is how these chains, you know, uh, like work. <laughs> uh, um, so I had 16 men photograph 100,000 rose petals in the former Bell Labs as a performance piece. And I, had, I then used that data set to create an AI of rose petals, but I had them pick one petal per rose that they considered most beautiful, which was embedding their subjectivity and creating a physical relic. I always like to have a link of, to the physical world, um, because otherwise, I think, you know, crypto can become a dog chasing its tail. And so, Bitcoin is now backed by these, these physical rose petals. And Bell Labs is both, is a really, like, pregnant space with symbology, because it's the birthplace of information technology. It's where experiments in art and technology happened. It also is where, um, where Haber and Stornetta invented and patented timestamping. And timestamping is the basis of blockchain. And it was four years after the patent ran out that Satoshi created Bitcoin and cites that paper. So it's a it's like a very special space. And I think it's interesting. I mean, you've got a work here at Art Basel, um, a physical work. So I think this is interesting, this idea that you have physical manifestations of your digital and very conceptual work um, and digital display, uh, physical displays of digital work is something we'd like to come to. But I'd like to ask you lastly, Sarah, about your um, non-existent, talking oh, yeah. about the existence of non-existence, your non-existent token project, which sort of pokes fun at some of the dynamics of the NFT market. I think this is a, is a good one for this. Yeah, so when the NFT market was like totally booming, I created, and it was, you know, I, just to kind of have fun, I created another conceptual artwork that was a smart contract called the non-existent token that is essentially an auction that goes on forever. So there's a website, you go and you place a bid and you actually send money and you get an NFT in your wallet of these bubbles. And then the next person can only bid at least 10% more, at which point you get all your money back plus 5%, and your NFT switches and turns into a receipt that advertises your return. And so essentially it's a, you know, it's like a, it's obviously like a, like a bubble <laughs> uh, that grows bigger and bigger. And it's, um, it's, it's a very honest Ponzi scheme. And it's funny because Ponzi and Ponzinomics is what a lot of the NFT projects try use to jumpstart growth. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of things have to start uh, not making money <laughs> and getting people involved to get to like escape velocity. Uh, but it was, you know, a, an honest Ponzi scheme, an NFT that can literally never go down. And the 5% that I make every time is like the royalty, right? So the speculative behavior that we see in NFTs is only permissible because artists are benefiting from the activity. So this was, yeah, and playing on like what is existence on the blockchain, uh, you know, because in this case, you don't ever really get to control the NFT that's in your wallet. And it's showing you the limitations. Like as a creator, all of the NFTs that I've created, I can on a moment's notice change the image on you. You don't really have legal rights as of now to prevent that from happening or prevent me from just shutting off the image completely. So just making people kind of aware, like I'm switching it to a receipt. 
I love how it's critical of, of the NFT market and plays with all of those notions. Um, I'd like to now turn to this idea of middlemen or middle women, I, I should say. Um, and the blockchain ethos enables artists and collectors yeah. to be independent. And there's been a lot of talk about how you can sell directly, mint directly. There's no need for galleries, uh, curators, advisors. Well, we'd perhaps argue differently. I mean, I'd like to ask each of you, do you think we need middle women to navigate the space, particularly when it comes to knowing what to collect and how? And Kate, I'd like to ask you first, how do you help collectors navigate the NFT space as a gallerist? Well, I think it was kind of always with Utopian, you know, just to eliminate or deny, you know, the traditional art market structure. You know, I think there are like each player, like artist, collector, curator, uh, dealer, um, critic, you know, um, who, who writes about things. Everybody has a purpose and there is a reason why the traditional art market functions in, in this certain way. I think it's been already for last, well, 10, 15 years when this kind of um, feature characteristics of each, you know, uh, character in, in the art market started to evolve and probably uh, blurry a little bit, you know, because curator started to be a collector uh, or a gallerist the uh, collectors started to validate with huge private collections instead of museums, you know, also uh, to, to certify that this is a very important work of art. And if you, as an artist, made to the private collection of this and this um, big family name, then basically it's like an institution. So this kind of, you know, uh, bl blurriness, you know, between these um, functions, you know, started, uh, happened already lots of years ago. Um, and with the introduction of blockchain, you know, it's another thing like, oh, let's democratize the, the market. Um, that's a beautiful idea. Let's do that. But does it really work? I mean, also in a society, does this really work? I mean, we are where we are now. We all know the political situation. So does it really work? I'm not sure. So, I mean, at least to try these things, I mean, the, the, the whole thing started. And then we see basically that we have marketplaces, we have an artist, we have a collector, but quite fast, majority of marketplaces have realized that they need the curation, they need some sort of um, education. And who can educate? Basically curators, right? Curatorial program, um, galleries who also invest a lot of time and dedicate um, a certain um, additional uh, also research, you know, like why this particular program, why to pull this artist together, what's the concept behind it, by the thematics and stuff like that. And when everything started back in 2017, 2018, I mean, majority of crypto art, uh, first of all, nobody called it NFT. Nobody knew about NFT. What? Fungible what? Like, come on, uh, nobody really cared. So everybody was like, okay, crypto art. So if it's a still image, and it was like a popularity of still images everywhere. So still images was a hype, everybody was buying still images. Again, as soon as the market developed, you know, we had like animated images, we started to have more uh, capacity, you know, also to exhibit video art, you know, and 3D models, and then kind of the space started to evolve. And with more introduction of different mediums with different kind of is it photography? Is it a generative art? Is it a VR? Is it AR? What is it? You know, like then of course you need to educate people. So curation and middlemen and middle women, um, they still have a job <laughs> to do. That's why we are sitting here. Um, because at the end of the day, um, this gap is still not filled and you cannot really um, physically fill this gap, right? Because if you start to, to um, dedicate all your time as a marketplace to talk to the artists personally, and there are thousands of them, to talk to collectors and educate each collector and, and you know, advise like Fanny does, for example, you know, on a on a tete-a-tete -tete base, um, then obviously, you know, you will have to also employ m hundreds of, of people, right, to actually do that job. So this is what the galleries do, uh, do right, uh, and also curators who are trying to um, educate through the special programming um, to enable also people who are outside of the tech space to understand what's going on and the importance of actual 
digital art and generative art and why this is special and why this artist is, uh, is unique or pioneering, etc., etc. So, I mean, I don't think it's the right thing to, for me as a gallerist to say, oh, no, no, guys, you need us. No, I don't think it's my... Uh, I mean, maybe yeah. it has to, somebody else has to say it, Kate, we need you. Um, um, but um, I think we do, and actually now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Because back in 2017, back in 2018, honestly, if I was just a collector and I wanted to come to the space, it was quite easy to navigate. Yeah. And I could navigate, right? Because there were a few marketplaces, few cool artists. The art and tech space was very friendly and very small. You Everyone could tweet, knew each other. You, could, you knew yeah. each other, everybody. Right? You, you could tweet each other. Everybody was super friendly, super supportive. Now, with all the PFP projects, with anonymity, with Twitter hypes, everybody is behind some sort of PFP avatar. And nobody actually understands, you know, who is behind. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Not the same, but but still, you know, like um, it's 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 huge. The space is huge. There are so many platforms. There are so many artists. There are so many um, also collectors, flippers, and investors. You know, DAOs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that you are literally, particularly driven by majority of social media and and and. Um, uh, advertising, which advertises only the cool projects or PFP projects or collectibles, it's far away from being actual to reflect the, the, the reality of cool digital art. This sounds like my yes, inbox. I mean, as a journalist, we're deluged with, with press releases about NFT projects, and it's the same, I think, for all of us. Fanny, I just wondered if I could ask you, I imagine there's more of a need for an advisor given the amount of material there is out there. Some of it absolutely terrible, I have to say. Um, as an art advisor, in, how does the NFT space differ to, to the mainstream market? And what is the number one thing you would advise clients when they first start collecting NFTs? Um, I mean, there's, uh, there's definitely, as Kate said, like now uh, there's an acceptance that um, there is a need of guidance, uh, um, not gatekeeping, but guidance based on the um, sea of bad options, uh, good and bad options that are out there. Um, I, I think it's, um, I mean, m my practice specifically is, is quite traditional for art collectors as we uh, focus a lot on, on education, connecting them to artists, uh, to form a relationship directly between collectors and artists and, and build meaningful uh, collections. And um, I think, I mean, of course the content is different, uh, but uh, what you know, like there's always like this idea that like, oh, this is going to be very complicated. Like this is all like tech aspect um, uh, to understand uh, and I'm not saying the contrary, like there's, um, there's a whole uh, technical uh, base um, that uh, you need to go through. But uh, what we realize is that most often when you start um, uh, with an artist, with their story, like, like Sarah did, and you get very excited about the concept and the art, then we'll figure out the technical aspect or, you know, like their assistant will figure it out. It's not rocket science. I think this is like where, um, like that we've seen very powerful, uh, to actually be that middle woman, but like not withholding the power in the middle, but like really connecting the dots. Uh, because as Kate said, there's many, many, many more dots than, uh, even a few years back. And, and I think this is also, you know, there's a new technology, there are new opportunities uh, and, and, and opportunities to adapt uh, business models like galleries, curators and advisors and, and how uh, we work with artists and collectors. And I think like that's where the technology needs to be used for the better, reassessing like power balances and, and economic models. I think this is uh, quite a, a great opportunity and, uh, uh, and also working with artists. I think this is like, you know, what you see with collectors is, is the same with artists, like, um, like the successful ones, um, right now are, um, you know, either the one more like, uh, but at least like the very popular one, right? Like, uh, they're the loud ones, the one that controls social media that like uh, do their own marketing, et cetera, et cetera. But majority of artists, they want to create art. They don't want to become their uh, chief technology officer, chief marketing officer, chief community officer, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, there's um, definitely um, that, that need uh, is, uh, is still out there. So. One thing to add is that I, I think 
one great thing about that we have all this noise, that we have all these people, is that we have a lot of people that have been creating art that have never been able or would not be able to find their collectors because they are not in Europe, they are not in the United States, and we are just enabling them to put their art out there and to reach people and to try to find their community, their collectors, uh, like-minded artists. And this is where I think one of the best things about what we are seeing in NFT art, that there is no need for the middle men or women to get in, although right now it is helpful to have guidance, and this is something that I'm passionate about. But you, know, you can get in, you can try to find your space. And if you are relevant and if you, are, if you put out some type of art that connects to a lot of people, that people respond to, you will start getting, getting these invitations and these selections and you will have the opportunities that you wouldn't have had had you joined this online space. So it's much more democratic in the sense that you can be in Latin America, you can be you know, in Africa, and although, yes, the, there is difficulty in trying to get into online spaces in those countries as well, but at least you'll be able to find and survive dignifi a dignified living from the art that you wish to make. And, and uh, even though we still need middle people, it enables people to try to give this first step in this direction. So do you, yeah. you use advisors and galleries when you buy? How, do you, how does it work for you? Do you use? I actually, I connect directly with artists. I, I don't think I have ever gone to a platform to look for art that they have curated. I serendipitously find things that I like. Uh, friends show me artists that they believe I will like because they know me well. And, and we exchange messages and we talk usually, and I fall in love with the piece and I buy it and then I'll go to the artist and I have received so many physical pieces of the NFTs I buy because it, it is also wonderful not only to have them on, in a, you know, on a screen at my home, but also to receive the physical pieces and sometimes like mementos of the, the photographs, uh, like uh, the piece of jewelry that was used for a photograph. So it's so special, this connection that we are able to make because we're all in the same like, uh, little communities there. Right, because I wanted to ask you about yes. display and whether you, have, whether you ever are advised about display as part of the purchase of an NFT. But you're saying you get sent sort of mementos or ephemera from, am I right? Yes, uh, either the digital art itself is printed and signed by the artist and they send it to me, or the photography is then sent to me. And uh, a very special relation that I have with a photographer, she sent like a piece of jewelry that she has used for, for the piece. And uh, I have... I, I don't even know how many physicals of the things that I have bought as NFT. So I have you know, screens at my home that I, where I can look at all my portfolio, and I have on my walls permanently things that I collect as NFTs. So um, I like the, the bridge because I have collected art before. I like the physical. I, it, it, it's appealing to me, and I like having that. And I think this is where we can bridge a lot of the traditional collectors too, is this physical digital you know, merge that we can do where you have the provenance of the NFT is a proof that you are the owner of this particular piece and wherever it goes next, it, it's all you know, registered. We will not have a problem with provenance. And you have the physical that you can just leave permanently on your home if you'd like. Sarah, if I could ask you as, a, as an artist, um, you're represented by a mainstream gallery, Marian Boeski, who you've got to work with, a lovely, beautiful work with on the stand here at the fair. Um, given that you can sell uh, NFT straight to market, why, would, why join a gallery like that? <laughs> She's in the audience. Oh, hello, Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, well, first of all, what Kate was saying is that gatekeepers, gatekeepers do, first of all, they do matter. Um, we're starting to see Not that. Not everyone is a gatekeeper. We but are more like I, an intermediary. Gatekeeper, here, intermediary, like intermediaries matter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and the truth about the NFT space is that it is absolutely the case that some of the artists who have risen to enormous prominence in terms of their prices 
are truly their own dealers and are dealers first and artists second. There are some artists that this is like currently the case because no one else is being an effective dealer, right, in, in, in the space. So as an artist, you don't really want to be selling your own work. It's like truly, um, it's, it's truly not my job, <laughs> like at all, to sell my own work. I don't want to do it. Uh, and, and two is, you know, like I'm speaking to the choir here, but becoming part of a gallery, there's a roster of other artists. There is all sorts of support that comes along with it um, that you can't do yourself. And that, you know, you need a, like a whole group of people to, to elevate you. Um, and so like, it's like a no brainer. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are many stories actually, you know, like I could share. Um, because in, in your case, for example, you don't want to sell yourself, right? Or you, 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 you want to focus on creativity. There are artists who actually enjoy the process of selling and enjoy being on Twitter and enjoy to have constant um, socialization with the, with the crypto community and post uh, GM uh, good morning every time and, you know, have thousands of followers, you know, and then kind of tweeting again, like, okay, my drop auction starts in a couple of hours and uh, I'm going to sell this and that's please be then the last time, you know, and they are coming wearing different hats, you know, there are other artists like that, but there are also a bunch of artists who actually are very intimidated by the space. They don't want to be actively uh, socializing with collectors or being in uh, a little bit also sometimes from time to time toxic social media space, right? Um, they are overwhelming. They also don't want to be bullied by collectors because actually there are many, many stories behind this scene. I mean, nothing is so pretty as it looks like, uh, the same as in traditional art world. So um, gallery or a, an advisor, an, an intermediary person can also help you to cope with certain situations that believe me, you don't want to cope yourself. And there are many, uh, different stories over the last three, four years, you know, with the crypto space where we had problems with uh, collectors bullying the artists, why female artists also didn't want to show their face and stayed anonymous for some reason. Again, there is a reason why. And then there is an intermediary gallery who puts a foot down and say, hey, you know, you know our name, you know where we are. Um, we buy, you buy the art from this is the price and that's it, you know, so basically you are kind of here also watching for the security of the space in some sort of way, right? And now, I mean, before it was a gray area, no taxation, no reporting, crypto, whatever, you know, everybody could transact. Now, at time, it comes to the space also to be regulated, you know, at some point. And also, you also need probably invoicing, you also need inventory to be placed in order, you know, as a collector, if you're collecting thousands and thousands of work. And again, you know, if you buy from the gallery, it's a certain validation, extra validation for you that there was an intermediary, because what if something happens to this third party market? If something happens with the artist, at least you have a gallery in 10 years who will say, yes, you bought it from us. Yes, this is the artist. Yes, we can still find you a connection to the artist, whatever. And we can probably also help you to reincarnate the work if something happened to that, right? Yeah. So I guess, you know, the importance over time becomes more and more valid. So we've got about 10 minutes left before we throw it open to a Q&A, but I would like to address the elephant in the room. Well, it's not really an elephant in the room. It's quite clear that this is an all-female panel, and I think that's worth celebrating in a field which is still very male-dominated. Um, and if you could perhaps talk a bit about identity and gender. Kate, in 2020, you launched the Women Supporting Women project, um, which was an online exhibition of female generative artists. And clearly, the idea was to support female artists. But what about bringing in fem female collectors? Um, I think you, you gave a statistic, which is that uh, only 16% of NFT sales are made to women. Um, is that correct? Most collectors are men. <laughs> what can be done to change that? Give money to women. <laughs> What can be done? What can be done? Yeah. I mean, we need the power. I mean, what can you do uh, to change the space in order to collect, in order to support female artists, or not only female artists, whoever you wish to support? You need to have a financial freedom. In order to have a financial freedom, you need to dedicate, obviously, some certain uh, amounts or foundation or build up some uh, DAOs, you know, yeah. to support women like, uh, like uh, B did. 
Um, and of course, you know, uh, not everybody has these possibilities, right? Um, but uh, what can be changed? I mean, of course, I, I've been collecting before uh, NFTs, you know, uh, female uh, photographers and female artists also, not because I necessarily uh, wish to dedicate only that. It's also like, you know, the relation of how you feel around this art, right? And also, if you look at the statistics, what happened in a traditional art market is also a very sad situation. I mean, we're not very far away. In crypto space, yes, we have more women. And actually, if you look at the super rare uh, statistics, you see that the majority of female artists are in the top 10, you know, by sales. But it's very, very exceptional. You know, it's not really a benchmark. But OK, we have more female artists and actually super talented people. But female collectors, this is something very very important and and by supporting female artists is one thing we can exhibit them we can collect them we can encourage more collectors to come and collect them but how do we encourage female collectors to start collecting this is something very yeah, well, the, the men they got in early on eth on on, on bitcoin and everything yeah. so they got it all cheap so now they have this humongous amount of ETH yeah. they can just play with and collect whatever you know to, to their heart's desire but women haven't had that. And one of the things that we want to do uh, is just to enable women to build the Web3. And so on, when the next thing comes, that they are here to be early and to also gather you know, this, this wealth that will enable them to enable other women. Because we, we will gravitate to people that have similar experiences to ours. And that's what happened in all of the spaces that you can think of for generations, because that's where the men were. So if we have more women building, they will be able to generate wealth because they will be there at the beginning of the technology. They will be, be there to uh, put their voices out, to it's be heard. It's a different energy. It's a different energy. And honestly, yeah. if you look at the traditional art world without Guggenheim, without Whitney, without Frick, I mean, those are amazing women who have built up their collections of modern 20th, 20th century, right? Yeah. Like, this is the energy. The same energy we should probably build before we go to the metaverse. We have to reflect on what's going on in the existing physical space, look at the mistakes we have made in the past, look at the auction sales, look at the Art Basel sales, and then, you know, try to make a homework change. and change. Yeah, a change. And then build up together the space and maybe also bring power to female collectors. Fanny, can I ask you, how can the NFT space differently tackle some of the issues that we see in the mainstream market of gender and racial inequality? Um, yeah, I mean, on top of uh, what B and Kate said, I think there's a, um, there's a real need uh, to encourage women to talk about uh, what they collect because, yes, the number are small, but there are amazing collections uh, of crypto art made by women. I represent one who really fell into um, the whole rabbit hole, pseudonym, uh, whole collection. And women tend to be better patrons as well, not because they're risk averse or like all the cliche that we hear, but because they co collect more often with an intent. And, um, and, you know, we all have biases, uh, women as well. So like, but, uh, when we collect, uh, we might be more re like, you know, prone to, um, support other female artists. So, uh, it needs to become a virtuous cycle, uh, and, uh, yeah, getting them early as well as we said, this is very important. Another thing that I think is, uh, uh, is important is to, not only give the platform to female trans and LGBT artists to show their work, but also to amplify their messages. And, uh, and this is to me, what has been very exciting about, um, watching like artist communities and, and DAOs is a big uh, keyword, like, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations, but really communities of artists, uh, to form, uh, to get the voice, uh, and, the. Uh, platform they deserve. Um, you know, there are a million of them, but like Her Story DAO supports female artists of color, Cyberbad DAO um, support crypto artists of African descent. And, and actually, uh, Cyberbad DAO got a booth at um, Art Dubai um, as a collective, which would never have happened uh, if they were just artists individually uh, applying uh, to, the to the fair. So I think this is very inspiring and, and really needs to continue. 
To ask you about your DAO, you, you launched Rise DAO last year, which is a not-for-profit DAO focused on giving women in developing economies better opportunities to establish themselves in the tech and NFT space. I mean, it's quite apparent, but what was the thinking behind that initiative well, and how has it developed? Yeah, the thing was, I, I was seeing these tweets about like, oh, I want to see more women art. Where are the women artists? And like, they're boiling my blood every time. And, you know, you try to hire women developers and they're just not that many. And like, what can I do? I mean, a very comfortable position, very fortunate position where I can try to do something to change it. So I can try to use my influence in the space and my connections in the space to try to raise awareness and raise funds, because let's face it, we need money. And uh, so that's what we do. We, we pay these artists that do not have access to Ether to put their works on the blockchain, to put their in a nice curated platform, you know, that's also be, it's going to be relevant. It, it, it matters where you are. It does, you know, it, it matters if you are at Basel. So it matters if you are at a good you know, uh, marketplace. And we pay to settle the auction. We pay all the fees and we take none of the money because the purpose is to you know, provide for them and to onboard them and help them find their collectors. And now we are raising funds and we are just finalizing the development of our course to bring women to the Web3 as devs. Either if you have no experience, then you'll be able to join and become a junior dev. Or if you have experience and you want to become a Solidity developer, so the Solidity is the language to uh, write smart contracts. So everything is written on smart contracts on Web3. And you definitely get a job. And we definitely need women in these companies to say what directions things might have to change sometimes and what views we should be opening our eyes to. And we just need women all all around so we can see all the colors of the spectrum. And this is what we are trying to do now. This is our, my aim <laughs> currently in life, is to make Web3 a little bit better for everyone. You know, also for me, like, I, 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 I'm the first woman to do this. I'm the first woman to do that. But I don't want to be the only. Right now, I'm the only woman with an ape crypto, a CryptoPunk ape. I'm the only woman with the nouns DAO that has 26,000 Ether in the treasury. But I don't want to be the only. Like, I want to be the first. First is awesome. But I do not want to be alone there. The men have been amazing. And they have been terribly supportive. And I want their help to change this. And luckily, I'll be able to use their funds. <laughs> Sounds good. Sarah, what's your take on this? As an artist, what would best support you and other artists, female artists, to get into the space? I don't want to sound bitter. <laughs> <laughs> well. I have an insane claim to the space, right? That you can look up in articles, right? Articles were written about Bitcoin in early 2015, right? Before Ethereum. And, but if you would look at the pricing, right? Mm -hmm. Or if anybody has Bitcoin, it's, very, it's much lower than all sorts of projects that came afterwards that don't have any historical claim, right? Um, and that's just, that's just the reality of what you have to contend with. And so it's almost like I have to um, you know, sit on a panel and tell you about it and stake the claim that I was here. Because otherwise, you would assume that the earliest NFTs never had a woman in it, right? Um, and and that's, that's the truth. And, and it happens, like, you know, for example, <laughs> You know, a celebrity bought Bitcoin, right? It was their first NFT, but what they tweet about is a bored ape <laughs> because they're paid <laughs> to do this, yeah. right? Because, and then when you talk to an agency um, that is talking with a woman led NFT project, they tell you that they actually met with five men and that no woman was in the room, even though it's advertised as a woman-led NFT project. And so there are all of these, like, you know, pitfalls that are there. Um, and, um, and I think the feminine, it's not so much the name Bitcoin, but I think the feminine aesthetics are not yet really valued in the crypto space. Uh, and 
But that will, this will change naturally. Like, I'll still be here. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, you could say the same with mainstream art market. You know, feminine materials yeah. are still undervalued. Textiles yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is still, you know, dramatically undervalued. There is a perception around it being made by a woman. Therefore, it's worth less than a woman. That's ingrained in people's minds. We could go on about this, I, I'm yeah, sure, yeah, but we only yeah. have five minutes left. And I did want to ask you a final question about where you see the NFT space going and how you see it developing. But perhaps we could open it up to um, some questions if anyone in the audience has any one. Do we have a mic? Can we come to this lady at the front in pink, please? Oh, no. You next. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm an artist and designer working mainly with uh, digital fabrication technologies, so ways of uh, making the digital into the physical. So I was very glad to hear you mention uh, your interest for, for physical aspects of NFTs. And so um, I wanted to ask you what are some, your, some of your favorite uh, artworks which uh, include the physical aspect, um, maybe, also some, maybe especially ones which uh, go beyond uh, prints of, of, a, of a 2D image. Um, I, I have to say, I think my, my favorite one, that one that at least at the moment, because we all grow and evolve and things change, uh, is Ines Richlik's uh, photography that I have. And it's, it's a powerful piece about conflict and, as a woman. Uh, and, and this is the one where she has these rings and her hand is a bit bloody and, and it just, it, it shows our, she's uh, incredibly subtle and delicate and, and powerful. And that, I think, speaks to all of us in one way or another, because we have to. We have to fight and we have to be presentable. And so this, this is one thing that is uh, photography, so it's, it's also quite easy to, to have it in print. I also have, which is very dear to me, my noun, which is, you know, this, this token that you get to be part of this organization that a female artist, uh, she actually is a fashion designer, and she 3D prints fabrics. She printed it to me and sent it to me. And it's very special because not only is because it's, it's her project was the first proposal that I did for the DAO that was approved. Well, it was the first pro proposal and it was approved. Um, it was for a female artist that does this incredible, you know, incredible work with 3D printing. And it's the first noun owned by a woman. So it's just, it wraps like a lot of the aspects. So um, it, it, it varies a lot what I find it special about the physical, but yeah, it's just something that it has to have emotional value, I think, for all of us, right? Can I add one? Oh, yes, yeah. sorry, Fanny. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so, I mean, I'm just going to tell you one that is very special to me is uh, um, there's an artist called Anna Hoy, uh, and she is both um, a crypto artist and a tattoo artist. And she actually tattooed part of an NFT that I own by her uh, on me. It's a little extreme, but this is a great example that it can go beyond print. That's yeah. amazing. We can't yeah. ask you where it to show it, I presume. That's I can show you too. It's on my leg, so it's going to be awkward. And, and yeah. <laughs> Fine. Um, <laughs> thank you, Fadi. Uh, there was a lady in the front. Do you have a question? Can we get a uh, mic to... Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Noor and I am 13 years old. As a digital artist wanting to release a project in this atmosphere, um, I know Fanny gave advice to new collectors, but do you have any advice for artists like me? Good yeah, uh, you have to find someone to be with you from the beginning. I think he... I, I, to be fair, follow me on Twitter and send me a DM. I would love to talk to you after this. Um, you have... You, it's very daunting to start alone. So who do you talk to? Who are the people that are, will be genuine in helping you find your voice in this space? So your art, your voice in your art, you have, it's yours, it's within you. Uh, but to find your place in the space as it is now, you need to connect to genuine people who will cut the noise for you and, and, and help you out on the technicalities of it, on how to find the communities that you you relate to. So I think it's it's and there are a lot of one on ones on you know like these Twitter threads or these medium articles on how to start an NFT Twitter. And but try to find two or three people, artists, or women that have a couple of groups that you can exchange messages with that will 
be genuine with you. And I'd be more than happy to have Just come to talk to us after panel. Yeah. Great. Well, that's some great advice. Um, any more questions? This gentleman at the front. Hello, my name is Bob Monaghan. Do you find that most galleries start physical and go into NFT, or do people do NFTs from the get-go? Kate. Okay. Sorry, uh, so galleries doing? Do, gal do most dealers start as physical galleries and then move into the NFT space, or are there NFT-only galleries? <laughs> is that what you, your question? More they're, or less. They're both. Uh, they're, of course, physical galleries, you know. Um, Actually, no, there are not so many physical galleries who just decided all of a sudden, oh, OK, let's dump the whole thing that we've been doing for the last 40 years and jump into the NFT space, for sure not. Um, we have a perfect example here, Nagel and Drugster, Saskia in the room, you know, who has been exhibiting um, for traditional art uh, and art Basel for many, many years with a beautiful program. And last year, uh, revolutionized a little bit the Art Basel with the NFT curation by Kenny Schechter. Beautiful, um, curated, uh, dedicated work. So to, again, to test you know, with traditional art collectors and to understand you know, how we can merge the physical, the traditional, the crypto, and, and, and everything, right? From this perspective. So yes, not, not, not so many examples of actually traditional galleries going uh, to NFT spaces. But we have a lot of examples of NFT marketplaces opening up physical galleries, like Super Rare, for example, in New York, or um, many pop-up exhibitions you know, organized by DAOs or organized by uh, yeah, other marketplaces or digital uh, online galleries doing some physical shows, mostly showcasing um, NFTs and digital art on the screen. So, so far it's uh, more or less in, in, this, in this area. And then you have a few sort of the bigger galleries like Pace opening yeah. arms. Yes, like Pace yes. Burst, we have so Pace have sort of... uh, dropping actually, yes, the next work with um, uh, Art Blocks next week. I think the drop is going to take place on 21st in New York. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's going to be a beautiful um, and they're here. Beautiful exhibition. They are here, yes. Both and, Pace and, and Art Block. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, yeah, few galleries uh, with the, And of course, you know, there are galleries also who are actually specialized in digital art or both, because for Kate Vass Gallery, for example, digital is the term. So, where we have both physical and digital all the time, because both are important. So, we have to, to keep the balance. I don't want to ditch one and just, you know, completely. Um, avoid the other one. So, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, it's hard to choose this this guy at the back. He was very um, enthusiastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> we like the energy. Um, there are so many things to say, and it's extremely hard for us as human beings to exchange information um, with the depth that each one of us has in this room, all our life experiences. And I really hope that NFTs allow us to connect us in a way that would be faster and more efficient. Um, we have a project called Goats for Peace, which aims to create 100,000 uh, collectible NFTs, amongst other things. But really, the question is how to collaborate in this new age of NFTs. So we're working with education projects to train people in Solidity, to train people in, in blockchain and IT programming in Paraguay, uh, education pro projects in Western Africa where people really need to learn about peace. And the question is, how can we use NFTs for exchange, for building bridges and for peace? And so my question focuses now that Ether 2.0 is coming and that NFTs will have a better impact on the environment, what would be your advice for a really big, crazy artistic project being born in the time of Ether 2.0? And what would be your advice to really use art for peace. I'm, I'm not sure what the question is there, but I mean, I think that's a big, Sorry. big, first, well, there's, a, there's we, a loss in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think for, first we have to wait for Ethereum to actually I think I, I wouldn't zero. actually wait for Ethereum to put out. I think I would go for a box yeah. like such as Tezos, uh, yeah. which the has, chains, because yeah, yeah it, it, we, we still have very low transaction fees on Tezos, which are accessible in more places in the world than Ethereum, because, you know, the use, is different uh, anyway. Um, that's not getting into very technical terms, but 
right now you can use Tezos in more places because it's more affordable. Uh, I don't think we have to wait for if you really to be at that place. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time. You never know yeah. when it comes. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's, there's no need for that. And how to use blockchain to do more projects, to connect more people. I think actually the tools that we connect are not through the blockchain itself. Uh, we use Twitter, we use Discord, we use Telegram, we use, uh, th that's how we connect because we need uh, language to connect to each other. So unless your NFT somehow is, 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 is you know, bi bidirectional, it, which is not, you know, is it one direction only, it's very difficult to use it to communicate, you know, on, on a two-way street. You can put out your art, you can put out your information, you can, but you don't really receive anything from the other end. So I think the, the, the tools that we use nowadays to connect are different than the tools that we use to fund and to carry out the projects, right? I, I, what are your experiences? I think we could probably go on. That was a very open-ended question. So I yeah. think it's pretty fair to say that there are more questions than answers at this stage, but it just leaves me to thank you all very much for thank a wonderful so panel. Much. B, Kate, Sarah and Thank Fanny, you. thank you.